Oxford is famous for its university and colleges, but there is more, much more, to this renowned city. In this video, Rob Walters, your Oxford guide, provides a glimpse of some of the green expanses and leafy corners of his city. He will explore the extensive university parks, demonstrate the delights of Port Meadow and Christchurch Meadow, and gaze over the gardens of a few colleges. He will also introduce some of Oxford's secret bathing spots, then end by visiting the peaceful green resting places of some of its famous writers. Hmm, where to start? Well, why not right in the middle of the city, where the local council is busy greening Broad Street, that short thoroughfare which is overlooked by Balliol, Trinity and Exeter Colleges, and terminated by the university grouping of the Sheldonian Theatre, Clarendon Building and, of course, the Indian Institute. Turning left into Park Road, we zoom along to the University Parks, with its grand entry gate leading to a wondrous collection of trees, shrubs, flower borders and open grassland. I jog through there regularly and particularly enjoy the tulip trees on each side of this path. This is spring, so the tulip-like blossom will come later, but there's plenty of blossom around and this flower border is a constantly changing delight. The parks are bounded to the east by the tree-lined River Charwell, which delights punters and will take them to the south, to this intriguing punt slide, and beyond that to Parsons Pleasure, where university men used to swim naked, and thereby hangs many a tale. Punting back upstream through the parks, we encounter the gracefully arching Rainbow Bridge, which provides excellent views of the Charwell. Crossing over, we can just get a glimpse of Lady Margaret Hall, which has its own private punt park. Further upstream is the Charwell Boathouse, where anyone can hire a punt and pole lazily along the river. From there, we can see the bridge that links the modern College of Wolfson to the eastern side of the river. From that point, it's possible to walk through swathes of undeveloped land to the very popular Victoria Arms at Old Marston, with its large front garden sloping down to the river and offering a welcome stop for thirsty punters. But we have no time for that. Across the Wilson Bridge, we can see that the college building is rather modern, but the gardens certainly add to the greenness of Oxford. You could rest a while here before we start on a 15-minute walk through the tree-lined streets of North Oxford on our way to our next stop, the Trap Grounds. First, we cross the canal, which itself provides a green corridor into the centre of the city. Then, sandwiched between that and the railway line, lies this oasis, containing the only wild and undeveloped land on the western edge of the city. Though the track ground area is small, it boasts a variety of green habitats, and some kind person has provided beautifully handwritten notes describing the flora and fauna there. From there we can cross the railway line to enter the vast Port Meadow. This is common land where you can graze your horses and cattle, if, that is, you are a commoner of Oxford. It stretches all the way up to Wolvercote, a village forming the northwestern border of the city. It is at this end of the meadow, at Godstow, that an Oxford don called Lewis Carroll told stories to a young girl called Alice and you know the rest. Port Meadow floods every winter and often the River Thames which forms the western border overflows and they are one. However here we see the scene in April and this lake is seasonal. It regularly dries out in summer and water birds that have congregated on it, swans, ducks, seabirds etc are replaced by the grazers. Port Meadow is a popular spot for picnickers during the summer and many boats berth here alongside the Thames. At the base of the boat park, part of the river flows into the Castle Mill stream 
and this junction is a popular swimming location for wild bathers and sometimes trash students after their exams. The main river then flows through to the south of the city, passing under Folly Bridge. This is said to be the location of the Oxen Ford, which gave Oxford its name. After this, the Thames forms the southern end of Christchurch Meadow. Looking from above, there's Christchurch itself. And as we sweep over the meadow to the south, we can observe the extensive greenness of this area and see its southern border with the Thames. Though only a few minutes away from the city centre, this Oxford treasure is countryside personified, with its long-horned cattle grazing the lush grass and a long avenue of lime trees leading from the river to the meadow gate of this grandiose college of Christchurch, with its historic and filming associations. On its journey towards London, the Thames receives the waters of the River Charwell at the southern tip of the meadow, and this energetic punter will have to pull back up that river to return his punt to Magdalen Bridge Boathouse, just beyond the Botanic Gardens. This 17th century physic garden is the oldest in Britain and has some 5,000 varieties of plants on display. It is part of the university, but the land is owned and overlooked by Magdalen College. Magdalen College itself has some striking and admirable buildings, which you can see in my video devoted to it, but this college also has one of the most beautiful and certainly the most extensive gardens. They are entered through these ornate wrought iron gates which lead to the tree-lined Addison's Walk beside a branch of the River Charwell. On the left is the Deer Park which is unique to Magdalen and an excellent source of venison. Addison's Walk turns to the right and continues for a long stretch beside the water meadow, an area famed for its snake head fritillaries. There are then a couple of bridges across the branches of the Charwell leading into the Fellows Garden, which slopes down to the river. Beyond that, we could continue upstream to Parsons Pleasure and thus complete a great circle of the city centre. But instead, let's visit another. College Garden. Worcester College's buildings cannot compare to Magdalen's, but its gardens, though smaller, are certainly special. Here's a view of the main quad. How's that for green? And there's more, much more. Here's the garden just below the quad, with its lovely border and eloquent gardener. But its crowning glory is the extensive lake. The garden borders the Oxford Canal to the west and shares wildlife with it, including otters, deer and bird life. New College has a rather special garden for two reasons. First of all, it is bordered by the old city wall, and second, it has an interesting mound in its centre. Though tree-covered nowadays, the mound used to have a spiral footpath for the ascent. Um, what's left? Well, I've limited this video mostly to central Oxford, but I do realise there are some wonderful green spaces further out, and here is a list of them. I just want to spotlight the last one on that list, South Park. It is a beautiful green space of itself, but what makes it very special is the very good view that it affords of the city and its wonderful dreaming spires, so aptly named by the poet Matthew Arnold. Cemeteries provide many green spaces in Oxford and the city has produced many famous writers, so let's combine these two for a conclusion to green Oxford. Hollywell Cemetery is the most central. Take a five minute walk down St Cross Street from the flower border we saw in the University Parks and you will find St Cross Church, now part of Balliol College. Hollywell Cemetery is secreted just beyond that. The two are not associated. It is a large cemetery extending down towards the River Charwell and it is full to capacity. The writer I've selected from this green and sometimes neglected place is Kenneth Graham. 
Through wind in the willows he gave pleasure to so many, yet his grave contains a great sadness. His son, Alistair, is also buried there. He took his own life whilst a student of Christ Church and just 20 years old. Head north via the Banbury Road, and then, on the outskirts of the city, you will find Wolvercote Cemetery, which is not actually in Wolvercote. This is a very large place, with its own chapel, and it is still in use for new burials. The Roman Catholic section here contains the grave of J.R.R. R. Tolkien, a grave that also contains the remains of his wife, Edith. His grave is modest, but it is probably the most visited in the cemetery. Fans of this great writer leave gifts and notes behind them. In the Headington Quarry area to the east of Oxford, there is a church called Holy Trinity Church, which boasts a Narnia window. And so it should, since this is where C.S. Lewis worshipped, and he is buried in this green and shady churchyard together with his brother, Warney. Lewis lived nearby in a house called the Kilns, and his large and wooded garden has now become the C.S. Lewis Nature Reserve, and is open to all, and makes a fitting bookend to this video on Green Oxford. Oxford is so green, and I'm green too. In the background here, you see the field that Margaret and I have been rewilding for many years now. I use a green screen for these finales. And this is what I really look like when I'm making them. I really do hope that you've enjoyed this video about Green Oxford. Oh, and if you haven't already, please subscribe. And don't forget to click that notify bell. Bye bye.